Hi everybody, welcome to Spanish 1020, and I'm glad that you're here. Um, so something that I like to do for all of my students is just to make a very short YouTube video regarding the concepts that you're going to be seeing in the course. So um, in these videos, we're going to cover all of the vocabulary words you're going to be seeing, all the grammar topics, and in the same way that in an in-person class, you might be asked to do some practice activities in class and make sure that you understand before you go on to doing your homework, tests, and quizzes. Here in the online course, my goal is to do the same thing for you. So in this video, there are gonna be times when I ask you to pause your audio, work out a few problems, and then um, keep moving. And um, so that will happen to make sure that you're nice and prepared before you have to go and do your activities and your quizzes and your exam in MindTap. So uh, as we get started here, uh, some learning objectives for our chapter, some goals. Um, in this chapter, you're going to be learning how to identify parts of the body and communicate regarding health conditions, uh, describe activities using what we call reflexive verbs in Spanish, express what you and others have just finished doing using the verb acabarde in an infinitive, communicate about characteristics and conditions of people and things, uh, differentiate between the verbs ser and estar, which both mean to be in Spanish, and use demonstrative adjectives and pronouns to avoid redundancy. So as we work through the video, those are our goals that we're going to keep in mind, and uh, we'll make sure you feel really good about all these topics before we move on. So first, let's look at some parts of the body. You can see um, el cuerpo humano here, the human body. Um, and these are some very technical terms. Uh, for example, you see el músculo, a muscle, el corazón, your heart, el cerebro, your brain, la garganta, your throat, los pulmones, your lungs, el estómago, your stomach, and el hueso, the bone. Uh, over here you see some other things such as la rodilla, one's knee. Um, notice if you look at his fingers here, los dedos are pointing to his fingers. Interestingly enough, um, in Spanish, your toes are actually referred to as your foot fingers. So a foot in Spanish is el pie. Again, dedos are fingers. So when you look at toes, we have los dedos del pie, literally the fingers of the foot. Kind of interesting there. Uh, here we have his leg, la pierna, his ankle, el tobillo, el brazo, his arm. Remember the Z in Spanish makes an S sound, so it's not brazo, but brazo. We have el coro, his elbow. La espalda, his back, and el cuello, his neck. Okay, finally over here to the left, you can see uh, the parts of one's head. The head in general is referred to as la cabeza in Spanish. Uh, you have a boca here, her mouth, la boca. Los dientes are the teeth inside of her mouth. Kind of looks like dental. Maybe we'll help you remember that, dientes. Here we have la nariz, her nose. Los ojos, the eyes. La cara is the term that refers in general to her face. Las orejas are her ears. And el cabello or el pelo can both be um, used to refer to someone's hair. Okay, so these are the vocab words you're going to see in this chapter. Um, a lot of the activities may give you a series of words, kind of like this one. You may see something like this in MindTap this week where it's going to give you a series of uh, body parts and you have to decide which one doesn't belong. Okay, so for example, the example, the, mo the modelo, the model here, uh, gives you three items. It gives you los dedos, your fingers, las manos, one's hands, and los dientes, your teeth. Well, if you think about fingers, hands, and teeth, which one doesn't belong? Obviously, uh, it has to be your teeth here, and the reason why it might not belong, uh, it gives you an explanation here. Los dientes son partes de la cabeza. Um, los dedos y las manos son partes del brazo. So your teeth are part of your head, and um, your fingers and your hands are part of your arm. So they don't go together. They're in different parts of the body. So I'd like for you to pause your audio for just a moment. Take a look at numbers 1, 2, and 3. Uh, for the sake of time here, we're just going to do uh, numbers 1 and 2 together. But I want you to try 1 and 2 and see if you can figure out which body part doesn't belong and see if you can explain why in Spanish. So go ahead and take a moment, pause your audio, and give this one a try. Okay, now that you've had a second to try here, uh, in number one you see la boca, the mouth, la cara, the face, and el brazo. Hopefully you decided that el brazo, the arm, does not belong uh, because the arm is not part of the face or your head as uh, both face and, and mouth are part of your head. Um, 
The arm is not, so it does not belong. Number two, el corazón, el pelo, and el estómago. El corazón, the heart, el pelo, the hair, and el estómago, your stomach. Obviously, of those here, we would say that el pelo probably does not belong. Uh, el estómago, your stomach, and el corazón, your heart, are part of your um, of your upper body. And uh, el pelo is obviously not. The hair on your head uh, is not part of that, so it uh, does not belong. Okay, I know that sometimes memorizing vocabulary words can be hard. Of course, in MindTap, you have the flashcards where you can study and review, and I highly recommend doing that. But also have a little video for you here that's kind of funny. Uh, be glad you're not taking this class in person, okay? If you were in person with me, I would make you go through and sing the song or do the dance. But unfortunately, being in an online class, I'm just going to make you listen to it. Um, but I do encourage you to listen, sing along. It will help you remember these words, okay? So let's take a moment, um, and we are going to watch a very short YouTube clip together. Okay, so you can kind of get the idea here. Maybe as a child, you studied the head, shoulders, knees, and toes song. Same kind of thing. So, cabeza, hombros, rodillas, pies. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Cabeza, hombros, rodillas, pies. So, um, that's our vocab for this chapter, referring to those parts of the body. That's our first vocab segment. Uh, the first grammar or estructura segment that I'd like to talk to you about are reflexive verbs. Okay, so a good little catchphrase for you to remember here is that a reflexive verb in Spanish ends in se. Okay, and what that means, if you look at all of these verbs on this page, you can see, you, you maybe learned back in Spanish 1010 10, that um, verbs in Spanish or infinitives end in AR, ER, or IR. And that's true. Reflexive verbs add a se to the end of that AR, ER, IR. So for example, you see acostar se to go to bed. Acostar is your verb, and you have the reflexive pronoun se on the end there. Banarse to bathe oneself. Banar is to bathe. The se is added on the end there as your reflexive pronoun, so on and so forth. So you see a lot of these verbs here. I do encourage you to study these. Again, there's flashcards for these in MindTap, or you can review those. Um, but a reflexive verb in Spanish ends in se. Go ahead and get that stuck in your brain. First, we're going to talk about how to conjugate the verb lavarse. You may be familiar with uh, the box here with your subject pronouns. I love using this box to help students understand the conjugation process. Uh, really quickly, just to make sure you remember from Spanish 1, let's go back and talk about these for your subject pronouns. Hopefully you know that yo means I, tu is you, informal. We have él, he, ella, she, and usted, you, formal. Up here we have nosotros and nosotras, both of which mean we. Nosotros is we masculine or a mixed group. Nosotras is we feminine. Same thing here, number five, we have vosotros and vosotras, uh, which both mean you all. Vosotros is referring to a group of men or a mixed group, and vosotras is referring to a group of women. Uh, in both cases, these are translated as you all, and vosotros and vosotras are only used in the country of Spain. Okay, down here we have ellos and ellas, both mean they, ellos, they masculine, ellas, they feminine, and then ustedes, you all, or from the south we say y'all. Okay, so as we look at conjugating this verb lavarse, the first thing we need to do is separate the se from the rest of the verb. Just go ahead and chop it off, um, get it out of your way for right now, okay? The next thing we need to do um, is take this se and we change it. 
based on which box it is going to be going, based on how we conjugate it. So the say, when you're talking about yourself, becomes may. And by the way, these reflexive verbs are used when you're doing something to yourself. So uh, I wash my hair. Well, if I'm washing my own hair, it's reflexive. So the say in this case is going to change to may, because I'm talking about myself. If you're talking about yourself, the say changes to te. For the he or she form, it remains a say. No changes are needed. For the nosotros form, your say changes to nos. For the vosotros form, your say changes to os. And for the ellos, ellas, ustedes form, it still remains as se. Okay, so that reflexive pronoun, again, a verb is reflexive when you're doing it to yourself. So if she is bathing herself, we're going to use the se. Okay, um, now, still talking about lavarse here. The first thing we need to do to conjugate lavarse is chop off our AR. We're left with lav, L-A-V. We can go ahead and carry that all the way down. Okay, so we've kept our pronouns, me, te, se, nos, os, se. We've added um, the stem of the verb, lav, all the way down. You may recall when conjugating an AR verb in the present tense, we chop off our AR and we add the appropriate endings for the present tense. Those endings are o, as, a, amos, ais, and an, respectively. So, if I were looking at this and translating these, me lavo, I wash myself. Te lavas, you wash yourself. Se lava, he or she washes him or herself. Nos lavamos, we wash ourselves. Os lavais, you all wash yourselves. And se lavan, they wash themselves or you all wash yourselves again. Okay, so notice without the pronoun, without the green part, the me te se, nos os or se, lavo just means I wash. Okay, so if I wash the dishes, that's not reflexive. I'm not washing myself. I'm washing the dishes. So I wouldn't need any of these green reflexive pronouns. Those are only there when you're doing something to yourself. Okay, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Um, so in a, just a basic sentence, and I stole this from your book, it says that Juan Carlos se levanta a las ocho. So Juan Carlos gets up at eight o'clock. Well, did he get himself up? Probably, yes. It's not saying someone else woke him up, it's just saying he gets up. So because he himself is getting up, he's doing something to himself, that is reflexive. We need the reflexive pronoun of se in front of levanta. Um, now, just to help you with this, we are. I'm going to give you a chance to practice conjugating in just a moment. I have a little song. You'll learn this about me this semester. I love corny songs, okay? But this song is going to help you remember and understand when to use reflexive verbs. So uh, bear with me for just a moment. I have another short video for you here where you're going to get to go through and um, sing this song. It will get stuck in your head, I promise. Here we go. At the bottom of the screen with a few different examples of reflexive verbs. Feel free to sing along once you get the hang of it, and I'll sing it three times. A reflexive verb in Spanish ends in say. First you gotta get the say out of the way. Then the verb you have to change, and the say you rearrange, and the say becomes mete no sos or say. A reflexive verb in Spanish ends in say. First you gotta get the say out of the way. Then the verb you have to change, and the say you rearrange, and the say becomes mete no sos or say. A reflexive verb in Spanish ends in say. First you gotta get the say out of the way. Then the verb you have to change, and the say you rearrange, and the say becomes mete no sos or say. Then the verb you have to change, and the say you rearrange, and the say becomes mete no sos or say. Okay, so again, um, you can see that these songs are helpful. So looking back at the verb lavar, that's exactly what we did. A reflexive verb in Spanish ends in say. First, you got to get the say out of the way. And then the verb you have to change, lavar, we change the verb. And the say, you rearrange, it went in front of our conjugated verb lavar. And the say becomes me, te, nos, os, or se. So you can see that we did that process. Sometimes the song helps people better understand. So I'm going to give you a verb now. This is the verb levantarse, which means to get up, as we said earlier. Uh, I want you to take a moment, and I want you 
to give these a try. So pause your audio and practice just conjugating the verb levantarse. say. Okay, so go ahead and pause me. All right, now that you've had a second to try these, as we look at levantarse, obviously you can see what we're doing here. Um, the first step, a reflexive verb in Spanish ends in say, but first you gotta get the say out of the way. All right, so let's move it. The say is out of the way. The verb we have to change and the say we rearrange and the say becomes me, te, nos, os, or se. So we've already got those reflexive pronouns in here for you. As we conjugate the verb, when we said we have to change the verb, to conjugate it, we need to chop off the AR and levantar and carry down our stem. We carry down the levant all the way down. Now we need to add our appropriate AR endings in the present tense. So to say, I get up, we're going to say, me levanto. You get up, te levantas. He or she gets up, él, ella, usted, se levanta. We get up, nos levantamos. You all get up, os levantáis. And they get up, se levantan. Okay, so you can see those all the way down. Um, and that's just another little summary of that for you there. Okay, now this is where things get tricky. There are situations where a verb is reflexive, meaning it ends in say, but it also has a stem changer. And you, you probably recall your stem changers from back in Spanish 1010, right? So uh, look at a verb like acostarse. Uh, we're doing all the same things we did before. There's just an extra step involved. So a reflexive verb in Spanish ends in say. But first, I got to get the say out of the way. So let's go ahead and take that say, move it out of the way. We know that the say changes to me, te, nos, os, or se, as we filled in. With the verb acostar, to conjugate it, we're going to chop off our AR. We're left with acost, which we're going to go ahead and carry all the way down. Okay, just, just go ahead and get that down. And then we're going to add our AR endings. O, as, a, amos, ais, an. Now, you would think that uh, we're finished, right? However, we're not, because as we said, acostarse is a stem changing verb where the O changes to a UE. Now, just very quickly, in case you don't remember from Spanish 1000, um, our stem changing verbs, we refer to as what are called boot verbs, meaning they only change when they're inside the boot. So if you look at our magical box here, you can see the boot encompasses everything. If you, you could draw a boot literally around these last few areas, it encompasses everything except for the nosotros and the vosotros. As you can see here in this visual, the boot is encompassing everything except the nosotros and the vosotros. That means that the verb acostarse, the O changes to a UE everywhere that it's inside of this boot. And when it's not in the boot in the nosotros and the vosotros, it remains as an O. So if we, were, we apply this back to the verb acostarse, we'll go ahead and change our O, as I've done here in yellow, to a UE for you. You get me acuesto, te acuestas, el, ella, usted, se acuesta, and se acuestan. But nos acostamos en vosotros, os acostáis, because these two were not in the boot. So therefore, they did not change from an O to a UE. Okay, so watch out for those. On your vocab sheet for this chapter, you will know when a verb is a stem changer, uh, when a reflexive verb is a stem changer, because it'll have over in parentheses next to it that it changes from an O to a UE. It'll tell you that, okay? So a couple of notes here that you need to know. Um, earlier, we talked about body parts, and it totally makes sense that we're putting body parts with reflexive verbs, right? Because what are you brushing? Well, you're brushing your teeth, or you're brushing your hair, right? Um, what are you washing? Well, you're washing your face or you're washing your body. So in this case, uh, you need to know those words. Now, this is the tricky part. People want to say, me lavo, I wash. Again, going back from that verb lavarse, which has been conjugated, me lavo, I wash. They want to say, me lavo mi cara, which looks like it would mean I wash my face, right? But that's not correct. For all of these reflexive verbs, anytime you're talking about a body part with a reflexive verb in Spanish, we use the definite article, those four ways to say the. We're going to use either el, la, los, or las when referring to reflexive verbs. We do not use the possessive adjective, mi, tu, su, nuestro, vuestro, etc. We're always going to say, literally, I wash the face. Me lavo la cara. La cara. Not mi cara, la cara. You're going to use the definite article, el, la, los, or las. Be careful with that. That's something that trips people up on MindTap a lot, so be careful. Something else. 
Um, generally, 99.9% .9 of the time, your reflexive pronoun is going to go in front of the conjugated verb. And that's what we did in this box here as we were conjugating. Our conjugated verb, acuesta, 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 blah, blah, blah. We put the reflexive pronoun, the me, te, se, nos, os, or se, in front of that conjugated verb. Uh, if you do that, it's always going to be correct. You don't have to stress about whether or not it's right. So um, a lot of people who are learning Spanish as a second language, as a foreign language, prefer to do that as the simple way, right? You're just going to place your reflexive pronoun in front of your conjugated verb. Um, however, there is another option. If you don't want to place it in front of your conjugated verb, you can attach it to an infinitive or you can attach it to a present participle. So for example, uh, you may recall an infinitive uh, is any word that ends in AR, ER, or IR in Spanish. Uh, there always are verbs. It means to and something else. So hablar, to talk, comer, to eat, lavar, to wash, so on and so forth. In this case, um, bañar is our verb in this case, our infinitive, bañar, to bathe. So if you look here in our sentence, Juan va a bañarse. Juan is going to bathe himself. They've attached the se, the reflexive pronoun, to the infinitive. Juan va a bañarse, which is totally cool. Uh, if you want to put it before the conjugative verb in this same sentence, you could say that Juan se va a bañar, which would be okay um, as well. Or another example of it being in front of your conjugative verb, we have Juan se está bañando. He is bathing himself. In this case, está was our conjugative verb, so se went in front of it. Okay, and I told you again, you can also attach it to the present participle. Um, and we have here that Juan está bañándose. Bañándose. In this case, our participle, bañando, um, has the se attached to it. Okay, I notice I put a star for you here in green and made a little note for you. Uh, when you do that, when you attach that reflexive pronoun to your participle, so when the se is attached to bañando in this case, it creates an accent mark that provides a, a stress um, on that syllable here. So you have bañando se. So just be careful there. Okay, as I said, if you're ever unsure, just put it before your conjugated verb and it's never going to be wrong. Okay, um, so a couple of examples about, uh, we said earlier that a reflexive verb in Spanish ends in se. And we said that a verb is reflexive when you're doing something to yourself, okay? So there's two sentences here. Me despierto a las siete. So I wake up at seven o'clock. Am I waking myself up? Yes, I, I wake up by myself at seven o'clock. Me despierto a las siete. Okay, that's something that's happening to me. So in this case, it is reflexive and we use the reflexive pronoun me. However, if I say that despierto a mi hijo a las ocho, I wake up my son at eight o'clock. Well, if I'm not waking myself up in that case, I'm waking my child up, I do not need a reflexive pronoun. There is no me, te, se, nos, os, or se in front of despierto in this case because I'm not waking myself up in the second sentence. I'm waking my child up. Okay, so be very careful. I have a couple of these for you to try. Um... I want you to tell me if they're reflexive or not, and I want you to conjugate them accordingly, okay? So number one, it says mi madre, and I'll do this one as an example for you. Mi madre blank a mi hermano. So my mom blank my brother. We're saying that my mom gets my brother up. So is she, my mom's not getting herself up, she's getting my brother up. So in this case, um, this is not reflexive. So we're gonna take our verb levantar, we're gonna chop off our AR, um, and we're going to add back the appropriate ending. So we're going to say that mi mamá levanta a mi hermano. Number two, el estudiante duchar todos los días. The student showers every day. Well, is the student showering himself? Hopefully so, yes. So in this case, we're going to conjugate duchar. We're going to chop off our AR, replace it with an A. So the student showers, but he's showering himself. So we need to put the reflexive pronoun that goes with the student or he in front of the conjugated verb duchar. So we end up with el estudiante se ducha todos los días. Okay, um, so hopefully that helps you make some sense. Um, you will see an activity this week that kind of looks like this, talking about las actividades diarias de Tomás. You can see Tomás here. He's doing several different things. 
Um, in most cases, it looks like he's doing all these to himself, so we know that they're going to be reflexive. Um, let's look at the first example. It looks like he's waking up. You see a uh, photo of a clock here, an alarm clock, and it shows 6 o'clock there. So if we want to say that Tomas wakes up at 6 o'clock, I want you to practice your oral Spanish here for just a second and practice speaking me. So um, you may recall from earlier in our video, our verb for to wake up is despertarse. We're going to say that Tomas wakes up. Tomas se despierta. And in this case, um, I'll type it out for you so you can also see it. Tomas se despierta. Um, notice that the verb despertar did have a stem change from e to ie, and we chopped off our ar in despertar and added an a. So we're saying that Tomas se despierta a las seis. He's waking up at six. What about our second photo here? It looks like Tomas is bathing himself. So let's let's practice this if our verb here is bañarse. Uh, I want to say that Tomas is bathing himself. How would I do that? Yeah, you're right. Okay, the say's got to move. Moves to the front, still remains as say. Bañar, we're going to chop off our AR, put the appropriate ending on there. So we get that Tomas se baña. So we've conjugated the verb and moved our reflexive pronoun to the front. Tomas se baña. Okay, so on and so forth. So again, just to give you a little practice with these. Um, now, the second thing that you see in this chapter is the verb acabar de plus infinitive. And acabar de is the verb that means to have just. So, man, I just woke up, I just took a shower, I just finished um, the new season of 13 Reasons Why on Netflix, whatever it might be, right? To have just done something. So we're going to take our verb acabar, we're going to conjugate it in normal, normal old conjugation way. In the present tense, chop off your AR, you're left with acab, A-C-A-B. Go ahead and add your endings on there. O, as, a, amos, ais, an, which brings you to your full verb here. Acabo, I have just. Acabas, you have just. Acaba, he or she has just. Acabamos, we have just. Acabais, you all in Spain have just. And acaban, they have just. Notice, this conjugated form of acabar is always followed by a de and always followed by an infinitive. So, acabo de ir a la tienda. I have just gone to the store. Literally, I have just to go to the store. That is correct because ir is an infinitive form and our construction here is a conjugated form of acabar, a day, and an infinitive. People, I see this a lot on tests, people always say, acabo de voy a la tienda. No, 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 that's bad news bears. We cannot say voy here because voy is a conjugated verb, meaning that it's not an infinitive, right? So we need to leave it in infinitive form. We need to say acabo de ir a la tienda. Leave it in the unconjugated or infinitive form there, okay? Uh, another example for you, uh, this, these can be reflexive. So you see acabo de, I have just, Levantarme. Notice I attach the reflexive pronoun the me to an infinitive, which was one option, totally acceptable. Acabo de levantarme. I've just gotten up. Now, remember, if you don't like attaching it to the infinitive or to the participle, you have an option of putting it somewhere else. Do you remember where that place is? Mm -hmm. If you don't want to attach it, you can always place it before your right, your before your conjugative verb. So in this case, acabo was my conjugated verb. So I can take the same sentence and throw my me at the beginning in front of my conjugated verb. I end up with me acabo de levantar, which is also acceptable. So either way, you're saying that I have just gotten myself up. Okay, so I have a couple here that I want you to try going back to our friend Tomas. Um, and it's giving you a little expression talking about what someone has just done. So it says that Sara sale del baño. Tiene el cabello, el cabello mojado. So Sarah has just come out of the bathroom and she has wet hair. Uh, well, what has she just done? We're going to say that Sara acaba de, we're taking the verb of acabar and we're conjugating it to the ella form or she. We're saying that Sara acaba de bañarse. She has just taken a bath. Or you might say she's just taken a shower. Sara acaba de ducharse. Both are acceptable. Okay. Another example for you. Uh, number one says that Tomas se levanta de la cama. Tomas has just, or Tomas um, got out of bed. He's, he's getting out of bed. So if he's getting out of bed, what has he just done? 
he probably has just woken up. So we're going to take that verb despertarse and say that Tomás acaba de despertarse. Remember, in either of these, if you don't like attaching the se to the infinitive, you can throw it in the front. You could say that Sara se acaba de bañar. Tomás se acaba de despertarse. However, I will say with the verb acabar, it's common to see the se attached to the infinitive at the end. So Sara acaba de bañarse. Tomás acaba de despertarse. Pretty easy there. Now, I'd like for you to pause your audio. I want you to do the same thing with numbers two and three. Let's talk about what they mean to make sure you understand, and then I'll let you pause. Number two says that Sarita y Tomás se levantan de la mesa. Son las ocho de la mañana. So Sarah and Tomás have just gotten up from the table, and it's eight o'clock in the morning. What have they just done? Hmm. Okay. Number three, Juan Carlos sale de su cuarto. Tiene puesta ropa elegante para una fiesta. So Juan Carlos is coming out of his room, and he is wearing some very elegant clothing for a party. So what has he just done? Take a moment. Give numbers two and three a try. Okay, now that you've had a second to give these a try, in number two, when we're saying they've just gotten up from the table and it's eight o'clock in the morning, they've probably just eaten breakfast. Uh, so we can say that Sarita y Tomás, that they... Acaban. Now notice in this case I'm using the ellos form of acaban because Sarita and Tomás would be they masculine. Two people, uh, so we're going to use the they form of acabar. Sarita y Tomás acaban de comer. They've just eaten, and I could say acaban de comer desayuno. They've just eaten breakfast. Okay, Juan Carlos coming out of his room. He's wearing elegant clothing for a party. What has he just done? He's probably just gotten dressed. So we could say that Juan Carlos acaba de vestirse. He's just dressed himself. Or acaba de ponerse la ropa. He's just put on his clothes. Either one of those would be acceptable. Okay, so hopefully you're feeling good about this first half of the chapter. In the second half, we get into some fun, more medical terminology. So I'm going to start over here on the right with the farmacia. We're in a pharmacy, la farmacia. Notice that it's spelled with an F in Spanish, not a PH, la farmacia. And in la farmacia, we have a couple of things here. We have el antibiotico. I want you to say these with me too. Antibiotico. Notice there's an accent there on the O. Antibiotico, an antibiotic. La aspirina. La aspirina, aspirin. Uh, la medicina refers in general to all these things, uh, just to medication, medicine, la medicina. Uh, la pastilla is a pill, la pastilla. And uh, those look like very large pills. I wouldn't want to take those. La pastilla. Okay, and here we have la receta. I always have a hard time with this. Receta is um, that thing that the pharmacist gives you, uh, you or your doctor gives you that you have to go to the pharmacist to get your medicine. Yeah, your prescription. Um, I always look at receta and think about recipe because it can also mean that. But uh, you don't give your pharmacist a recipe, generally speaking, so or a receipt. So receta is your prescription. Okay. Over here, we're in a bad place. We're in la sala de emergencia. Say it with me, la sala de emergencia. Oh my gosh, where are we? The emergency room, oh no, right? So as you're looking around, you see all kinds of people back here in the back. Uh, you can see, uh, here we have an enfermera, which is a female nurse, la enfermera. You can also have a male nurse, el enfermero. Uh, the enfermera, the nurse in this case, is tomarle la temperatura a alguien. She is taking the temperature of someone. In this case, uh, le toma la temperatura de esta persona. Y um, this woman, we can see here uh, that she tiene fiebre. Fiebre. She has a fever. You can see her sweating here. Tiene fiebre. Okay. Over here, you see uh, these people. And um, you can see this guy. Tiene marreos. So he's looking pretty dizzy. Not looking so good. Tiene marreos. Over here, um, you can see more people. And you see this guy here. He's just <laughs> coughing. Uh, toser is to cough. Or you might say tener tos. To have a cough. I usually say that. Tener tos. Um, this woman, she tiene escalofríos. So she has some chills. Escalofríos. She looks chilled. Uh, this woman tiene dolor de cabeza. She has the pain of the head. Or we would say she has a headache. And this old man here, tiene nauseas. He's nauseous. And this one is the grossest one of all. This dude in the pink has to estornudar. He's uh, sneezing. Estornudar. So 
yuck, lots of good medical terms here. Uh, okay, so we're not gonna do all of these, but just so you can get an idea of what you're gonna be doing um, in the chapter this week. So for example, for someone who has dolor de cabeza, which we said was a headache, what might they do in order uh, to, to relieve that problem? Well, someone who has a dolor de cabeza, they're probably gonna tomar aspirina. They're gonna take an aspirin, an aspirina, in order to um, help that headache, right? What about someone who has a dolor de estomago? What are they gonna do? Yeah, they might tomar petobismol. They might uh, take that to, to help their stomach pain. You could probably say that for someone who's nauseous as well, right? So lots of different um, options here. Okay, so just very quickly, because I, I know I'm, I'm taking up your time here, I want to make sure that we hit the highlights. Um, it is important to make sure you remember some things from Spanish 1010. In this case, you learned about the verb gustar back in Spanish 1010, which means to like or to be pleasing to. As we conjugated gustar, we, uh, we said a mí me gusta, I like, a ti Te gusta, a él, ella, usted, le gusta, a nosotros, nos gusta, a vosotros, os gusta, y a ellos, ellas, ustedes, les gusta. Now, if we liked one thing, like, me gusta la pizza, I like pizza. Pizza is singular. I'm liking one thing or a singular noun, so I'm going to use gusta, okay? But if I like something plural, like, I want to say that I like pizzas, me gustan las pizzas. In this case, I'm using gustan instead of gusta uh, because there's more than one pizza, so it has to agree there. Um, so again, if you like one thing, you're using gusta. If you like more than one, you're using gustan. Hopefully you remember that from Spanish 1010. Now, we have a verb in this chapter, and this is the verb doler, which means to hurt. Doler is a stem change from O to UE, and it works in the same way as gustar, okay? So if one thing hurts, we're going to use duele. And if more than one thing hurts, we're going to use duele. And when I say one thing, I mean something singular. So um, if my eye, only one of them hurts, I'm going to say me duele el ojo. If your eye hurts, te duele el ojo. His or her eye hurts, le duele el ojo. Again, it's not mi ojo or tu ojo or su ojo. It's el ojo, because remember with body parts, we're always using the definite article. So, me duele el ojo, te duele el ojo, le duele el ojo, um, so on and so forth there. Now, let's say you have more than one eye that's hurting, like my eyes hurt. Instead of me duele, I'm going to say me duelen, because in this case, there's a singular or a plural noun of eyes. There's more than one eye. So, me duelen los ojos, multiple eyes hurt. Te duelen los ojos, your eyes hurt. Le duelen los ojos, his or her eyes hurt. Nos duelen los ojos, os duelen los ojos, les duelen los ojos, our eyes hurt, your all's eyes hurt, their eyes hurt, so on and so forth. So be careful, if one thing hurts, duele. More than one thing hurts, duelen. There is no such thing as se gusta or se duele. That's not a thing. Don't get your reflexive pronouns confused with your gustar-like verbs. So here we have me, te, le, nos, os, or les. With our reflexive verbs we talked about earlier, we had me, te, se, nos, os, or se. So be careful with that. Doler uses le and les. Okay, um, I've already told you this here. Um, if my head hurts, it's me duele la cabeza, not me duele mi cabeza. We use the definite article. Um, and sometimes if you want to clarify who is in pain or whose head is hurting, you can use what's called the personal a in Spanish. So a mi me duele la cabeza. Man, my head hurts, okay? A Donald le duele la cabeza. Donald's head hurts. You generally see this personal I used in the third person because if you just said le duele la cabeza, we don't know if you mean that his head hurts, her head hurts, your formal head hurts. We don't know, right? Same thing with les duele. We don't know if you mean their head, um, your all's head. We don't know, right? So in this case, you have to use that clarifying personal A to specify whose head is hurting. So I want to let you practice these here, get a little more practice with doler. You can see in number one, I've said a mi, blankety blank, los brazos. 
Well, brazos are arms. There's more than one arm there. So we need to use duelen instead of duele. And in this case, uh, the indirect object pronoun that goes with a mí is me. So a mí me duelen los brazos. My arms hurt. Um, and we would translate that. The traducción is that my arms hurt. Okay. Let's look at another one here. Number two says that a los estudiantes blankety blank la cabeza cuando van a la escuela. So the students, um, their head hurts when they go to school. Really, you should have multiple heads here. So it should be las cabezas, right? So a los estudiantes blankety blank las cabezas cuando van a la escuela. The students' heads hurt. The students' heads hurt when they go to school. So uh, the students, to refer them or they, in this case in our first blank, we're going to use lace to say that their heads hurt. In this case, there's more than one head, so I can't just say duele, I have to say duelen. Okay, and finally, I want you to try number three. It says arrigo, blankety blank, la nariz. Um, hopefully, you've had a chance to try this here. Arrigo would be two or four him. So to say that his head hurts, we're going to use le. And nariz, he only has one nose, so it's singular, a singular noun. We're going to use duele instead of duelen there. Okay, so hopefully you're feeling better about those. Our next grammar topic to be covered in this chapter are the verbs ser and estar. Now remember, um, you can always fast forward or break up these videos at any point. So if you're starting to get a little, uh, little tired or you need a break, you can always pause and, and go uh, make some coffee and come back or whatever you need to do, okay? So here we are for the second grammar structure on ser and estar. And uh, these are the two verbs in Spanish that mean to be. Both ser and estar mean to be. Um, your book sort of gives a, a pretty good explanation here. It tells us that ser often implies some kind of fundamental quality that describes or defines the essence of a person, thing, place, or idea. So some examples. Soy estudiante. I'm a student. That identifies me as a person. Soy de Bolivia. I'm from Bolivia. That identifies me as a person. Um, whereas estar usually often indicates a state of condition of a person, place, or thing at a given moment. So it's some people like to think of ser as something permanent and estar as something that's temporary or changing. Um, so, for example, I could say that estoy preocupada por el examen. Oh my gosh, I'm so worried because of the exam. Well, am I always worried? Maybe. Maybe I'm just a high-strung worried person. I for sure am, okay? But in this case, estoy preocupada por el examen. I'm worried about the exam. I'm worried about something in particular, so that's my condition. Um, I personally don't like the way that your book introduces this, so I have a little extra something that I want to introduce to you here. So for ser, um, I wanted to also first just remind you of your conjugations of ser, which you should remember from Spanish 1010, but just in case you don't, put them on here. You have soy, Eres, es, somos, sois, and son. So I am, you are, he or she is, we are, you all are, and they are. So soy, eres, es, somos, sois, and son. Uh, I like to give the acronym of TOPIC to help you remember when to use SER. Uh, so TOPIC stands for time, the time of day, um, origin, where someone is from, one's profession, identification, or characteristics. So these are your reasons from topics. So for example, when I'm talking about the time, if I want to say that it's eight o'clock in the morning, I'm going to say that son las ocho de la mañana. It's eight o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to say están las ocho. I'm not using estar. I'm using ser here because I'm talking about time. Um, origin and nationality. So I could say that soy de Tennessee. I'm from Tennessee. That's my origin. That's where I'm from. I'm using ser. My profession, I could say that soy profesor, uh, I'm a teacher, so in that case, uh, I'm referring to um, my profession. I'm using ser because I'm talking about a profession. Identification, I could say that soy hombre, I'm a man, or uh, soy mujer if you're a woman, right? So that's uh, how I identify, it's my identification. And uh, characteristics, I could say that soy alto, I'm tall, or soy cómico, funny. So inteligente, however you want to describe yourself, right? Those are characteristics. Uh, some other things that are not included in topic that are listed here from your book. Mathematical equations oftentimes use. Um, 
ser, so dos y dos son cuatro, two plus two is four, dos y dos son cuatro. Um, you also oftentimes use ser when you're talking about impersonal statements like it's good that, es bueno que, so on and so forth. Um, but just, just topic is usually sufficient in helping you arrive at the correct answer when you're differentiating between these two. Uh, so that's when we use ser. What about estar? When do we use estar? Well, um, there are six conjugations of estar. Just in case you don't remember, you have estoy, estás, está, estamos, estáis, and están. These are our estar conjugations. Um, I added the acronym PLACE here to help you remember when to use estar. So PLACE stands for position, location, action, condition, and emotion. So my position, I could say that estoy en la oficina. I'm in the office today. Estoy en la oficina. Well, that's my location or my current position. Uh, I could say that el baño está cerca de la clase. So the bathroom is near the classroom. Well, being near the classroom, that's its position or its location. For actions, uh, we oftentimes see the present progressive tense used here, but I could say that estoy hablando, I am talking. Estás escuchando, you are listening. Uh, that ing, that's an action. It's uh, part of that present progressive tense. It's what you're doing. It's an action in progress. So um, usually ends in ando for an AR verb or yendo for an ER or an IR verb. And it's often translated as ing. Okay. So positions, locations, actions. You also use estar when you're talking about conditions. So I could say that estoy nervioso. Oh, I'm nervous, right? Well, I'm probably nervous about something in particular. That's my condition. Or an emotion. Estoy alegre, I'm happy. Or estoy triste, I'm sad, right? Those are uh, temporary feelings. Your feelings and your, your emotions, your conditions, they change a lot, right? You might be in a really good mood and then you get a speeding ticket. Nope, you're angry now, okay? So it's, it's a condition or an emotion that changed your response. So that's why we have two words in Spanish. Ser, those things that are generally stable and not changing. Topic, time, origin, profession, identification, characteristic. Whereas estar are those things that are more temporary and do change in nature. Your position, your location, your action, your condition, your emotions. Um, so I'm going to cheat a little bit. We're going to do this first in English. I'm going to give you a sentence in English. I want you to tell me if it would use ser or estar. And I want you to tell me why using a letter from either topic or place. For example, number one, Matthew is from Kingsport. Are we going to use ser or estar when referring to Matthew being from Kingsport? Well, go back and look. Well, Kingsport is Matthew's origin. That's where he's from. So in this case, we're probably going to use ser because that goes with origin. Number two says, it's seven o'clock. Are we going to use ser or estar or talk about it being seven o'clock? Well, uh, seven o'clock, that's a time. For time, we use topic, and topic goes with ser. So in this case, we are going to use ser, and our reasoning for ser is time. Okay, so I want you to take a moment. I want you to give numbers three, four, and five a try. Go ahead and pause your audio for me, please. Okay, now that you had a second to try these, let's take a look. Number three, my aunt is very funny. Well, funny is a characteristic. She's a funny person that describes her. Uh, so in this case, I'm not saying she's being funny right now. I'm just saying in general, she's funny. That's a stable characteristic. We're going to use ser, and it's a characteristic, as we said. Number four, the book is beside the computer. I'm talking about the book's location or the book's position. So therefore, I'm going to use estar. And number five, Maria is tall. Well, Maria being tall, that's a characteristic. Tall is something that doesn't change. So we're going to use ser because it's a characteristic. All right, so we've cheated. We've started in English. Now let's give this a try in Spanish, okay? And I put these at the top to help you. You have ser and its acronym topic in green. And you have estar and its acronym place in orange, okay? I'm going to give you some sentences in Spanish now. And you have to decide which one to use, ser or estar. You also have to conjugate it correctly. You have to give me the reason why. So for example, number two, de donde blank tu. So de donde, from where blank you. I'm asking where are you from. In this case, I'm asking about your, where you're from, your origin. Okay, so let's go ahead and put that in. Your origin, want to know where you're from. De donde blank tu. Well, um, with ser, because of origin, the two form of ser in this case is eres, as you can see from the chart above. So we're going to say de donde eres, that's your origin. 
Number one, ask us, donde blank el baño? Where blank the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? Well, I'm asking about the bathroom's position or the bathroom's location, which is a star. The bathroom in this case would be it. Um, so we use our bottom left box for singular nouns like that. So el baño it está. Donde está el baño? Where is the bathroom? We're using a star. Okay, so I'd like for you to take a moment, pause your audio, and give numbers three, four, and five a try for me, please. Okay, now that you've had a second to try, number three tells us that los niños blank enfermos. Oh, the kids are sick. Well, sick in this case, enfermo, is a condition because um, you're not always going to be sick, hopefully. And um, for los niños, the children or they, we're going to use our bottom right box here. We're going to say that los niños están enfermos. Number two, Juan Marcos blank muy guapo. Oh, Juan Marcos is very good looking, very attractive, very handsome. So um, in that case, good looking, handsome, attractive, um, that's a characteristic. Juan Marcos would be he, so we're going to use es as our Sierra word. Juan Marcos es muy guapo. And number five, tu blank nerviosa antes del examen. So you are nervous before the exam. Well, nervous, as we know, is a condition or an emotion. Um, and the two form of estar in this case is estás. So tu estás nerviosa antes del examen. Okay, so um, this gets tricky because there are some circumstances where you can change out the sentence and use ser or estar and it can change the meaning. So for example, uh, we're going to talk use that word guapo again, handsome or attractive, good looking. And it says that Carlos es guapo. Carlos is handsome. He's always handsome. That just describes him. He's a handsome guy. Carlos es guapo. Okay. Um, whereas if we say that Carlos está muy guapo hoy, wow, Carlos looks good today. He is handsome today. So maybe Carlos normally wears sweatpants and a t-shirt every day, but today he's dressed up. He's got a nice shirt on, a tie. He looks good. Okay, so in general, Carlos is handsome, but Carlos está muy guapo hoy. He's very handsome today. Going back to that difference again, so um, when we're using ser, it's a permanent characteristic. He's handsome. He's always handsome. He's just a handsome guy. But today, he just looks really good. He's very handsome today because he has uh, changed up his look. So it's something temporary. So we're using a star. Okay, there are some situations where... Um, this actually changes the meaning of the sentence also. So look at the example here about Sara. We said that Sara es aburrida. She's boring. Whoa, offensive. She is boring. Okay, but we can change out that es for esta, and we can say that Sara está aburrida. Well, in this case, instead of saying she's boring, we're saying that she's bored, right? There's a difference in being a boring person and just being bored. Uh, this also works for like things like fruit, like la fruta es verde, the fruit's green, okay? It's just a green apple, that's the color it's supposed to be. Whereas la fruta está verde, uh, the fruit's pretty green, it's unripe in this case. Think about like a banana or something. So uh, interesting things there. The same is true up here with listo, ready or smart, so depending on the context. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about today are demonstrative adjectives and pronouns. I don't know about you, that, those are some big words. Demonstrative adjectives and pronouns. Uh, in English, we translate these demonstrative adjectives and pronouns as this, these, that, or those. Okay, so that's what we mean when we're talking about demonstrative adjectives and pronouns. There's a little jingle that I will never forget. My high school Spanish teacher taught me this and it stuck with me for years. Um, in Spanish, this and these both have T's. That and those don't. Okay, what I mean by that, uh, look at this first line of my chart here, this and these. Singular, uh, this in Spanish can be either este or esta. Uh, it depends on uh, whether what you're talking about is masculine or feminine. So I could say um, este perro, this dog, este perro. Perro in this case is masculine, it ends in an O. So we're using este, this. Whereas... Um, Esta pizza, this pizza. Esta pizza is feminine, so we're going to use esta. Both of them mean this, but you have to make it agree. So, este or esta, this. If you add an S to those, um, you have 
estos and estas, uh, notice that there's an O here. It's estes is not a thing. There's not ES. Estos and estas. Uh, so this and these both have T's. So again, these dogs, estos perros, um, multiple dogs, plural, these dogs, or estas pizzas, these pizzas, again, plural. So this and these both have T's. Look at them. There's a T in all these. This and these both have T's. Well, notice if you chop out the T's, you have the exact same words. Este, ese. Just take out the T. Esta, esa. Take out the T. Estos, esos. Estas, esas. Take out the T. This and these both have T's. That and those don't. Okay, so that helps you arrive at those demonstrative adjectives. This and these both have T's, that and those don't. Now, in some cases, you will also see the term aquel or aquella, or aquellos or aquellas. Um, and the most common situation where you might see something like this is if you were in like a department store and you're talking to your friend and you're like, oh my gosh, look at this shirt, it's so cute. This shirt, you're gonna say, esta camisa, this shirt right here. Oh my gosh, look at it, it's in our, it's right here next to us. Esta camisa, it's so cute, okay? Or and she's like, no, I don't like that shirt. Look at that shirt over there, okay? Well, you're still standing close. We're not talking about this shirt that I'm holding. We're talking about that shirt, which is like still on the table near us. Esa camisa, okay? But then if you see something hanging up all the way across the room, it's on the back wall and you're like, oh my gosh, no, 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 I don't like this shirt, I don't like that shirt, I like that one way over there, look at that one on the wall. We're gonna say aquella camisa. So um, you can sort of think about these in a way of distance, like if it's super close to you, this shirt. If it's still semi-close to you, that shirt. But if it's that shirt, shirt way far away, you're gonna say uh, aquella or aquel, depending on the the gender of the word you're talking about. So, so some interesting things there. Um, you can also use these generally as well. You can use esto, eso, and aquello, different from what we saw before. Um, so sort of the masculine singular version of these. Um, these are referred to as neuter forms technically. You have esto, eso, and aquello. We call these invariable pronouns or neuter forms. Um, these are very like unspecific objects or things, very general, very vague. So um, I do not like that. Aquello no me gusta. Well, you don't like what? You just don't like that, okay? No comprendo eso. I don't understand that. What specifically do you not understand? In general, you just don't understand that. Maybe it's class, maybe it's a certain subject, you don't get it. Esto está mal. This is wrong. Well, what's wrong? This, that, what, what in particular? Just this is wrong. Very general. ¿Qué es esto? ¿Qué es esto? ¿Qué es aquello? What is this? What's that? Very, um, very general. So, some opportunities for you to practice these. I left uh, this chart available so you can fill it in with this and these, that and those. Um, and then I've given you a sentence in English that I want you to translate to Spanish. I like that class more than this book. So let's do this one together. I like that class. Well, remember, this and these both have T's, that and those don't. You may remember that clase is feminine. So if I were saying this class, I would say esta clase. But I'm, I'm saying I like that class. So this and these both have T's. That and those don't. Ditch your T. So I like that class more than this book. Um, again, this and these both have T's. Este libro. Okay. Another example. I don't want those books. I want these books. This and these both have T's. Estos, that and those don't. Remove your T. So I don't want those books, I want these books. Okay, so you can see those kind of explained. I have another example for you here. Um, I don't want this soft drink, I want that soft drink. And I don't like this pen, I want that pen. I want you to take a second and give these a try for me. Okay. Now that you've got a second to try these, I don't want this soft trick. Remember, this and these both have T's. So we have este. It has to be with an E because it's agreeing with a masculine singular noun, refresco. So no quiero este refresco. I want that soft drink. This and these both have T's. That and those don't. Okay? So if you go back and you look at your that and those again, you can see that the that form here is ese. Okay? So all you have to do is drop your T. So this, take out the T, ese. 
you have that. I don't like this pen. I want that pen. So this pen, can I say este pluma? No, senor, you may not. Why not? Well, pluma is feminine, and it's singular, so we have to make it agree. So instead of este pluma, we're going to say esta pluma. Well, I want that pen. Okay, well, no problem. Esta, mm, that's this pen. Remember, take out the T, and you get esa. This and these both have Ts. That and those don't. Okay, I mean, goes, hopefully you're feeling better. Now you should know how to identify parts of a body, communicate about health conditions, describe daily activities using reflexive verbs, express what you and other people have just done using the verb acabarde plus infinitive, communicate about characteristics and conditions of people and things, differentiate between the verbs ser and estar, and utilize demonstrative adjectives and pronouns to avoid redundancy. This and these both have T's, that and those don't. So friends, that is everything for chapter five. Um, please know that I'm always here to help you with whatever you need. Uh, we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting if you want to talk more. You can email me at any time. My email is mtharrison at pstcc.edu. Please feel free to drop me an email at any point. I check my email religiously and it will respond within 24 hours or less always. So please feel free, drop me an email if you have questions. Guys, I hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful week. Take care.